church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of different things. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me. Hi.
may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mountain View United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we're especially excited to have you here with us today. We hope that uh, we hope that you'll find something here to call home. We'll hope you'll find someone here to uh, relate to, and, and uh, we're we're just excited to have you here. And uh, we hope that you'll find that this could be a place that you do call home. A uh, place where you can uh, decide that you want to grow together with us as we uh, seek Jesus together. Here at Mountain View, we believe that God is changing lives. <laughs> Amen. And uh, that's something we're excited about and passionate about. And uh, wherever you are in that journey, whether uh, you're just beginning or whether you, you, you think you're pretty far along in it, uh, this is a place that you can be. And uh, we're just glad to have you here. A couple announcements that I want to just draw your attention to is, um, uh, let me see here, one is, if, I hope you got a bulletin, uh, everything is on there that uh, is pretty pertinent that I hope you'll read it. Uh, let me just say this, the, the trunk or treat we had Friday night was awesome. If you, met, if, you, if you didn't come to trunk or treat, you missed out on a fun time. It, even though it was cold and it rained on us, we got wet. We had a blast, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of you here. Thank yeah. you guys for coming out. Thank you for your help. Uh, those who uh, participated, thank you so much for coming. It, it was We had a lot of fun. And, um, and, and I, th I think there's some folks maybe who might be visiting today who came through for Trunk or Treat. So we're glad you came here. And uh, uh, there's pr probably still more candy in the fellowship hall. Uh, so uh, in fact, I, I'm quite certain of it. Someone take it, please, because I'm going to eat it. And, and that's going to be bad. Uh, I'm going to eat it for quite a while. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, we still have, there's some flyers in the back if you want to take one. The third week of November is the drop-off time for that at, uh, at First Baptist Church. There's two boxes and the information on how to do that is, is located in those, on those flyers. And uh, tonight we have our Connect Groups meeting at 6.30, along with our student ministries, our youth, our children's ministries, our nursery. There is something for everyone. If you're not involved in a small group, I want to highly encourage you to come on out and get involved. Bring your kids with you. There's, there's something for them. We've got a great program for kids all the way up through youth. And uh, I think there's a new series beginning tonight. Is that right, Carolyn? Uh, for the youth. So uh, come and be a part of that. Bring your family. And uh, you won't regret it. I, it'll be a, a good time. Everyone is invited to that. I think everything else is in there by way of announcements. We have some special guests here who are going to share in just a few moments uh, about a, a trip to India. Not a trip, a, a, a movement. Uh, they're moving to India. And, and how we as a church might be able to partner with them. So uh, be looking for that. In the meantime, I'd like to invite you to stand and, and find someone here this morning that you can greet and tell them that you're happy to see them here this morning. <laughs> Yes, 
with other churches in the area as they venture out on this mission. We've been talking about mission here. We've been talking about going out to the ends of the earth and, and ways in which we can make a difference in the lives of others. And they're going to share a little bit about what they're going to do and, and how we might be able to help them. So uh, would you please welcome my friend Kevin. So my name is Kevin. This is Judah. My wife Jessica and daughter Shime is sitting right over there, and my daughter Mercy is down in your nursery. Before I start, I want to read from Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and ends of the earth. Break that down just real quick. When he talks about Jerusalem, he means around your own house, in your own community. When he talks about Judea, it means kind of going out a little piece, you know? If you go up to Cleveland or out in Chattanooga, that's kind of what he's talking about. Samaria means the places you don't want to go. Um, I don't know where y'all don't want to go, but I know growing up in Cleveland, it meant we didn't want to go to Polk County, so we still all have to go to Polk County and help them out. Uh, and then the end of the earth. I think that's pretty evident. That's far, far, maybe one more far away. Um, and that's kind of where we're going. Now, this video that you guys showed at the beginning of the church spoke to me. I, I, I wasn't prepared for that. But for 20, 23, 24 years, I was one of those people who made excuses why I wasn't going to go to church. You know, people at church, they're mean to me. I don't want to go to church because whatever reason. And I just tell my wife on the way here, it's kind of funny. I never went to church because 
there's three churches within a mile of my house. There was a church of God, a, a Baptist church, and a Methodist church. So pretty much all the bases were covered, but I didn't want to go. And it took someone who is willing to step out of their own comfort, inside of their own Judea, which is right outside of their own house, to speak to me, to, to be honest with me, to be nice, to be authentic. You know, my wife was that person for me, and she was authentic, and she wasn't judgmental of the lifestyle that I lived. She wasn't mean about the things that I did. But she was quiet, and she was offering me love, and she offered me a place to go. And after many times of being offered a chance to go to church, I took her up on it. I went to church, and I met people who were welcoming, who walked all around the church and shook my hand and said they were happy to see me whether they were or not. They at least said it. It made me feel that I was welcome to be inside of this congregation. And it was people like that who were willing to reach out in their own Judea. And who knows, I might have been some of y'all some area. They were willing to welcome me. And I started going to church. And then my wife asked me this question. She said, hey, you want to go on a mission trip? I said, yeah, I guess so. Having no idea this was something that was going to be pivotal. Something that was going to change the way I felt. Change my heart. Now, I'm not saying all of us need to go on a mission trip. Now, if you want to come, we're going to be there. Come and visit. But while I was there, I talked a little bit with some of you this morning. My heart was broken. I saw people. And it wasn't broken because these people lived inside of mud huts or they sat in dirt or they didn't have enough to eat. It was broken because they didn't have hope. They didn't have love. They didn't have the things that God offers us. Inside of this church, they didn't have it. And I realized that I was being called into missions then. We went to an orphanage while we were there. We met some little boys and it was their first days inside of this orphanage. And seeing them grapple with the realities of the world that their parents had left them there, that their parents didn't want them, that they couldn't afford them. And at five, four, six years old, seeing them grapple with this and coming into a community that said, we do want you, and we do offer you a God who loves you for who you are and where you are. Not gods who demand of you, but a God who just loves you. It was incredible. I came back home and I started attending a church for the first time in my life, which was Udawa United Methodist Church. And, and, and I was being asked to do things and step outside of my comfort. And someone said, hey, you want to teach five-year-old Sunday school class? And I said, no. But I did because I felt God was calling me to it. And I said no because I didn't even know all the words that Jesus loves me at that time. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't go to church. Who knows all them words? And luckily, those five-year-old boys knew all them words, and they started teaching it to me, and I started teaching them, and we started having conversation and dialogue. And the next thing I knew, I was growing up inside of this church. Even though at the time I was 24 years old, like a kid, I began to grow up, and I began learning the words to all these songs, and learning who God was, and what God called us to, and what purposes He has laid in front of us. And the next thing I know, they said, hey, do you want to teach youth? And I started looking, and all those five-year-old boys who had taught me the words that Jesus loves me, were now in the youth group. I said, that's my spot. They've been waiting for me. And I started teaching youth. And God began to do even more in my life and began to grow in me more. And I said to my wife, in 2002, we came back from India and we were excited. And we made a pledge that we would move to the mission field. And I feel God is really calling us there now. He has prepared us for the last 14 years for this point. And we went to India. Oh, we went to Atlanta first and joined the Mission Society. And they said, we can get you there. And I said, great. They said, but we have, you have to go through training. And I said, I can do training? You know, I went through, I was in the military, I did base training, I can handle this. They said, but we're going to do a training in India. And it was great. I said, I've been there. I know what's going on. Let's go. We went a week early so that we could visit that orphanage. And we walked in. And those boys who were four and five and six remembered us and came to us and said, for the last 15 years we've grown up in this orphanage and we have witnessed the love that God offers us. It was the same love I had been receiving here in Jerusalem. They had been receiving there at the ends of the earth. The same God who was filling me was filling their lives. And they said, you know what? Because of this, we are now in university. We are going to have a job. We are going to be able to provide. 
because of the help that you have given us, that the churches who have partnered with us has given us, we have a chance to not die on the streets as a beggar, but to give to others here. Their Jerusalem was being reached because this Jerusalem reached out to someone and sent them to the ends of the earth. And so we went on to training. And while we were there, we began to learn things. And all of a sudden, from the first week when my daughter looked at me, that we were there, the first day, not even the first week, the first day we landed in the airplane, we rode in the car, we're all happy, oh, we're so glad to be in India. We get to our hotel, the door shuts, and my daughter looks at me, and my son looks at me, and tears are streaming down their face. They said, Dad, why did you bring me here? And I didn't quite know. But at the end of that week, my daughter, who had spent that week sitting in the mud, sitting in the dirt, talking to these kids, eating food that was way too spicy for her, but she was still going to eat it because that's what they were all eating. She said that she knew why she was there, was called to be there. And our family began to grow and go through this training that they had. We learned. We learned that God had been grooming me, grooming us, grooming my wife, not just to go and and be there just for being there safe, but because we were discipled, and we are now ready to disciple others there. And we were called in the college ministry. That's why I grew up with those five-year-olds who are now in college, so that I have a foundation that I can teach other college students. And that is going to be our ministry in Delhi, India, where uh, it feels like an oven's turned on and someone's turned a hairdryer to blow on us. We're going to be there, and we're going to be teaching college students. That there is a God who does not demand terrible things from them, but loves them for the unique, unique way that they are, and has called them into worship. And here's the great part. Here's what makes me so excited to be here. God has also called us into His mission. When we read Acts 1 8, it says, We're going to go into, the, into our neighborhoods, into our counties, into our state. We're going to go to the places we don't like. We're going to go to the far ends of the world, earth. We had learned, we'd studied, and we'd been groomed. We've been told that this is not a command like the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not. And this is a mandate of God asking us to be in a mission with Him. It's a mandate of Jesus saying to us, My God has a mighty work. And He can do it all His own. But He is asking you to step in and to be His hands and His feet. And we are now at, here at this at this church, which we've been to a couple times, and your pastor has been really kind to us and has given us some time. And uh, we've asked him as a church, and you guys as a church, to partner with us. But we're also going to ask individual families to partner with us. My wife is going to hand out some <coughs> pledge cards uh, because we have to raise 100% of our funding for our ministry. Now, we get to do this through God, and we get to do this with everyone who partners with us. And that's what we're asking for. Uh, I'm going to tell you guys a, a, a quick story while my wife is handing this out. Now, I, I want to tell you guys something up front. I suffer from a terrible disease known as I remember things being way better than what they really were. And my wife has pointed out this out to me many times. But there's this guy who lives in India who I met and turned my life around while he was there and made me realize how important college ministry is. His name is Andy. Andy doesn't look like every other Indian. He looks Chinese, and me and him would joke, because I don't know if you guys can tell it, but I'm half Chinese. Uh, well, my stepdad's Chinese, so uh, that makes me half Chinese, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> me, and my, me and Andy would joke that we must be cousins because we look so much alike. And, um, and while we were there, Andy tells me, Kevin, I'm the first person from my village to go to university, college. And the reason I went is because America is bringing jobs over here, and all the people in my village knew if one of us could get a job, we could send enough money back to help the village. So they picked me to go. And while I was there, in a country of 1.27 billion people, and that's B with a billion, the city we're going to move to has 22 million people living in it. Um, and to put that in perspective, the entire state of Tennessee has 6 million people living in it. Um, he said, they sent me there, and my roommate happened to be Christian. He was one of the 2% in the entire country who was Christian, and he poured into me. He discipled me, 
and now I'm the first person to leave from university from my village to go back to my village. But I don't just bring them a job. I don't just bring them money. I bring them Jesus. I'm the first person to hear the name Jesus, the first person to hear the good word, the first person to see a Bible for my people. And I get to bring it back. And that made me realize college ministry is what's going to impact India. Dayton, Tennessee is what's going to impact India. Because you have reached out and, and worshiped with us and have done the things in Jerusalem that God has called us, has mandated us to do in Acts 1. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kevin and family. And I, I'd ask you to consider, uh, make, pray about how you might want to partner. At the pledge cards there give you information, and they're going to stick around for a little while after our service today, and I'm sure we'll answer some questions if you have any for them and, and how you might be able to connect with them in other ways. And uh, I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us, as a, both a church and a, as you as families or individuals, to uh, have, a, have your hand in, in reaching the ends of the earth uh, together. Let's pray, and as our ushers come forward, we're going to continue to worship God together through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, if our ushers would come forward at this time. They won't be so uh, surprised by this, but this is an empty book, an empty box. We call it What's in the Box. And uh, each week, someone different gets to take it home and put something in it that, and I don't know what's in here, right? No. No, I don't know what's in here. And uh, we open it up and we try, we, we connect it with a, a Bible story, right? So let's see what we have today. A Lake Winnie ball cap. <laughs> That's a hint. That's a hint? <laughs> Whose is this? Oh, it's yours. Yeah, I can tell it doesn't fit me. A Lake Winnie ball cap. My kids love Lake Winnie. Um, they, they've been bugging me to take them there uh, forever. Uh, so, what, what do you guys like about Lake... Who's been to Lake Winnie? All right. Several okay. What do you guys like about Lake Winnie? What? The The what? The cannonball. The cannonball? Okay. The rides. The rides. What else? That's it? Anyone like it? The prizes. How about the funnel cakes? Uh, yeah. Funnel cakes are awesome. Yeah. What? Else? Anyone else? What? The food. Yeah, the food's good. So you guys have all kinds of different things you like there. Who, has anyone been to Lake Winnie this summer? No. <laughs> That, that was my daughter going, no, <laughs> Dad, we haven't. Anyone been to Lake Winnie this summer? Yeah? What, no. no. What was your favorite ride there? No, you didn't go on any rides? <laughs> really? Well, what kind of trip to Lake Winnie was that? <laughs> so, so Lake Winnie, it's a, it's a fun place to be. Um, here, Brody, you can have that back. You know, it, it's fun to look forward to an exciting place to go. And, and do you know, uh, one of the things that we sometimes forget about as Christians is we forget that we have a, a really exciting place, uh, a wonderful place that we have all in store for us, for us, us who know Jesus. Where is that place at? What? Heaven, yes. And heaven is going to be, it, heaven is going to make Lake Winnie look like, right? Heaven is going to be awesome. And uh, the Bible tells us that we can look forward to it. In fact, that we ought to be excited about it. The Bible tells us. <clears throat> Zach, we're going to go to the first sermon slide if you could. Keep going. There we go. Excellent.
give them just a moment. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. How are we today? Good. How are we today? Good. 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 All right. Um, we're going we're gonna to recap here today, uh, closing up our series on the purpose-driven life, on living purposely, what it means to live a life of purpose, uh, the kind of life that God has uh, planned for you, you and I. So this is going to be sort of a summary of the last five weeks. If you missed any of those and you hear something today that you want to go deeper in, each of, these, each of these points you can go back onto our website and find the sermon online and watch that for each of these points. I hope you have your bulletin with you and you have a, a sheet in there with some notes like this. Feel free to follow along with that and write anything in there that may, might speak to you, something that you want to look up later on this week. I encourage you to do that. So let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Bow your heads with me. God, Lord, we need you here today. I need you, Lord, to speak. Uh, hide me behind your hand. I pray that the meditations of my heart, the words of my mouth, would be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. God, I pray that uh, if there be anyone here today, Lord, who doesn't quite know where they fit in all of this, or where they might fit in your plan, or um, why why, why we are even here today, God, I pray that uh, you would just surround them with your love and your peace and speak into their lives and to my life today as well, God. Teach me what you would have me to know as we study this together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we're going to recap, as I said, the last couple weeks here and, and just kind of get some highlights from each of these uh, purposes. But before we begin that there, I need to just let you know that we, we started all of this by saying that you were created for a purpose. Uh, you and I are here for a purpose. You and I were created, and that purpose that you and I were created for was to be loved by God. God created you, you, say me. me. God created you and me because he desired to love you. He desired to know you. He desired to be in relationship with you. So you were created because you were desired by God to be in a relationship with him. And so that is foundational. The Bible says that before the foundations of the world even began, that God thought of you. Yes. Look, look to your neighbor and say, God thought of me. God thought of me. And he thought of me and he wanted me. And, and, and you and I are alive today by God's design. God had a plan and a purpose for you. And there are five purposes that we've been going through the last five weeks that, uh, that speak to that design and speak to why you're here. So if you come in here today and you've been wondering, you've been sort of maybe aimless in life. Perhaps not your whole life. Maybe just the last, maybe just the last couple months, or the last couple weeks, or the last few hours, you've just felt aimless. Like you're kind of a, a ship without a rudder. You're sort of uh, wandering through life without much direction, much purpose, and, and things seem to be sort of chaotic. If that's you today, then, then today, today's words are going to speak to you. You, you. you can learn what it is that God has in store for you. You can learn that God has an aim for your life, a purpose for your life, and, and it's very clear through his word. And that's, my, that's been my prayer this week for you and I, that if you're feeling aimless, if you're feeling purposeless, that you would find that here today. So let's look at these five things. We're going to go through them quickly, all right? So uh, I hope you've got your pen handy. Number one, your number one purpose that God has for you and for your life is to worship. God created you and I to worship, to worship Him. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 says that you are a chosen people. You and I are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His wonderful light. So God has saved us, has called us, has brought us out of darkness and into light, and he's called us to worship him, to, to, 
give him glory. And, and the one thing that you and I need to know about worship that I want to bring home, we, we talked about five weeks ago what worship is not and what it is. But the number one thing we said is worship is not about you. Amen? Worship is not about you. It's not about me. Worship is about God. Worship is about giving God his worth, his glory, giving him glory, praising him for who he is. So we, we went through, you might remember a list we went through. We said worship is not about you. Worship is not about, we talk about music. Worship is not about music. It's not about, uh, sometimes we, we do this thing in church where we say it's now time to worship God and we sing. But worship, biblically speaking, is to be our whole life. Everything we do, um, from you're waking up in the morning to you're going to bed at night, everything in between, you and I are going to worship something. We're going to worship someone. We're going to worship either our, our, our careers, our cars, our, our friendships, our families, our, even our church, even religion. We worship something at one time or another. And God says, I want you to worship me. I created you. I love you. I want you to give me worship. And so worship is not about you and me, it's about God. And, and when we come to the church, when we come and gather here together, we, we ought to come expecting God to move and, and to work in, a, in our midst. We ought to come preparing our hearts to worship Him. So it's not about you and I. Number two, the second thing, the second purpose that we are here for is to fellowship. To fellowship. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. There's a purpose for our fellowship. A couple weeks ago, we, we, we talked about the difference between um, fellowship dinners, which I love. All right? I, I, love, I love a potluck as much as anyone else. Okay? And, and we Methodists know how to do it really well. I was, uh, I, I was at Delia's the other day having lunch, and happened to be, I didn't know it at the time, but as we got to talking, the guy I was with happened to be a Methodist. And, uh, and then as we were talking, some people came up beside us, and they knew him, and they started talking, and they too were Methodists. And, and uh, this was kind of a news to all of us, right? And, and I, I said to them, I said, we better be careful because a potluck might break out here. Uh, that's, that's, what, that's what happens, right? You get, get a couple Methodists together. Either a potluck or a committee. One of the two is going to happen, right? Uh, that's going to happen. So, um, but to fellowship, a, a biblical understanding of fellowship is this idea of coming together with the intention and the purpose of encouraging one another, to build one another up to grow in our faith, to spur one another on, to help each other, to bear one another's burdens, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, to mourn with those who are mourning, to suffer with those who are suffering. Our fellowship is to bring us together as brothers and sisters, as the family of God. There's a purpose for it, and it's to encourage one another, to build each other up. And so in your notes you see um, a prompt there. Who can I encourage? Who are you encouraging? Who are you fellowshipping with in your life? Who this week can you come alongside and say, Let's, let me encourage you in this? Who are you encouraging? That's one of the purposes we have. That, that's one of the purposes God created us for, is to fellowship, to be in communion with one another. To grow. Another way you can do this is through our small groups. We've been talking about that for the last many weeks. Get involved. If you're not involved in a small group, I want to highly encourage you to get involved into a small group. That is a great way for you to fellowship with others, to encourage one another, to be encouraged. Amen? Sometimes we need, sometimes I need encouragement. Sometimes you need encouragement. Sometimes we need to just have a place where we can say, hey, I need to lean on the strength of you for right now because I'm feeling a little weak. Number three, to grow, to become like Christ. To become like Christ is the other reason, a third purpose that God has for you and I. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says that God's will for you is your sanctification. If you ever wondered, what, what is God's will for my life? What does he want for me? It's right there in black and white. Boom. God's will for you and I is to grow up. Essentially, that's what sanctification means. It's, it's to grow up. It's to become more and more like Jesus. It's to, we go from a, uh, a, a, a baby, maybe in the nursery, to a toddler, and to into, into junior high and high school, and we grow up. Our spiritual life is, is much like, ought to be somewhat like our physical life, in that we are growing, we're getting stronger, we're uh, becoming more and more like Jesus. And the, the ways in which Jesus, the ways in which the, the tools that are used to grow us up are perhaps unexpected. We talked about this for an entire message, and, but just to highlight them here, God uses trials, temptations, and trespasses in our lives to help grow us up. Amen? Amen. God uses, uh, we, we said, you know, a, a good sailor is not made in calm seas. Right? I was in the Navy. Not that I drove a boat, but, uh, uh, but I did other things. But, you know, on, 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 a, on a ship or when you're out to sea, if all you had all the time was just glassy, smooth seas, is that someone, is that a good sailor, you think? Is that someone who's, I mean, when a storm hits, who do you want with you? You want someone who's been through a storm, right? You want someone who knows how to handle that storm. You want someone who's been through it. So God will use storms in our lives. God will use trials, temptations. He'll use the trespasses or the offenses of others in our lives to highlight something that needs to be smoothed out in us. Something we... Uh, some people are still talking about the line that I, I shared that week, which was a, a sign that was at Pure Life Ministries when I first got there. It was on the bulletin board in big block letters. It said, if someone offends you, you remember this? If someone offends you, ask the Lord what piece of flesh still lives in you that needs to die. Right? And and we, we, we teased that out some a couple weeks ago, but... The, the sense was that if, if I'm offended by something that you do, there's something maybe inside of me that has yet to die. Something that is maybe pride building up that needs to die. And I remember when I first saw that, I remember how offended I was by that statement. Right? How, how that just, I have a right to be offended. I, yes? No, I don't. I don't. Some of you are, yeah. No, no. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I, you know, if, if someone's offending me, I, I want to go and ask God, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? What, what do I need to learn in this? It's a very different way of looking at offenses or trials or trespasses in our lives to see that God wants to grow me up. He wants to build me up. He wants to build you up. Number four, the fourth reason we are here. Let, let, me, let, me, let me say something quickly about, about number three, though. In our small group last week, we were talking about how every one of us in the group ought to have something that we are growing in. And, you know, it's easy. We, we showed that video prior to the service starting up about reasons people don't come to church. We talked about how uh, some people don't come because we feel like we've got to get my life cleaned up and right. And, and one of the mistakes I think we make... As, as Christians, I'm really warm up here. Can we turn that fan on, Jimmy? Um, one of the mistakes I think we make as, as, as Christians, and I'm speaking, I'm speaking to myself here as well, is we talk about how God saved me from something in the past. And how I was, I was maybe a mess back then. Like, like 20 years ago, I was a real wreck. And then I met Jesus. And now my life is, is, is quite well and good. Okay? And, and we talked about in our small group how the, the purpose of, of fellowship and the purpose of getting together and growing up is, is to be vulnerable with one another. And being vulnerable with one another does not just mean saying, yeah, one day back in the day I was really a mess and God saved me. But it's to say, hey, this week, I've had a really bad week. 
this week, I, I, I noticed something inside of me that I didn't recognize was there before, and God is shining a spotlight on it and telling me, hey, that needs to go. This week, I, I, I didn't do so well in my time with God. I didn't have my quiet time with Him that I know I need to have. I didn't have my time in prayer or in scripture reading that I know I need to have. This week has been just really, this week has just really stunk, to be quite honest. Do you see the difference? The difference is coming to church and being, yes, I had a terrible past and now all is well. And the difference is, you know what, I'm still, I'm still broken and God is still at work in my life. God is still changing things in me. I'm not there yet where I want to be or need to be. But by the grace of God, I'm growing step by step, becoming more and more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's, I think that's just so important for us to understand. Is, uh, if, if you're a Christian here today, God is not done with you yet. And you will, not, you will not finish growing this side of heaven. There is always something more for you and I to learn, something more for us to become uh, uh, more like Christ in. And, and we, need to, we need to know that, and we need to pursue it, and we need each other to help us do that. We need each other to help us do that. So, number four, mission. God has a mission for you. <coughs> Remember a uh, week, couple weeks ago when we talked about mission, <coughs> and we played the Little Einstein's clip, we're going on a trip, right? And... Uh, we need you. God has a mission for you. And that mission we did we talked about exactly what Kevin said. Kevin didn't know that we talked about I don't think he 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 was he, he knew that, but we talked about Jerusalem, we talked about Samaria and Judea, we talked about the ends of the earth. And, and we gave you three ways in which you can do that. One of them, your Jerusalem was to find ten people. Ten people, friends and family to pray for. Pray that they would come to know Jesus. Pray that they would show up at church. Are you doing that? Have you named your ten? Have you written them down and are you praying for them? Those ten folks. Have you, uh, we talked about how our, our Samaria or our Judea, our, our community here, how you can get involved in recovery at Dayton and get involved in seeing the lives of people around us who are, who are hurting, whether it be addictions or whether it be compulsions or codependency or whether it be just grief and loss and pain, family issues, all of these things, have you thought about how you might get engaged and involved in the lives of people in our community? And we also offered uh, Operation Christmas Child, a way for you to reach out to the ends of the earth. And now you have another option in partnering with Kevin and Jessica and their family with India of ways in which we can reach out to the ends of the earth and know that we are sending the message of Jesus out beyond our four walls. So mission. God, God says, hey, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's Matthew 28, 19. We call it the Great Commission. Those are our marching orders. Those are our marching orders to go into the world and make disciples. Get off the pews and out into the world. Go and make a difference in the name of Jesus. Pull out your cell phone. Go out. You're on. Oh, I didn't bring my cell phone to church, Pastor. <laughs> Pull out your cell phones. Come on. Pull out. Hold it up. Hold it up. Pull up your cell phone. All right. Go to your alarm setting. All right. Some of you, if you don't know that your phone has an alarm setting, ask your neighbor to help you. Uh, Go to your alarm setting, and I want you to add an alarm for 9.38. And you can choose either AM or PM. All right? 9.38. All right? Just trust me. I'm going to tell you why here. Just a second. Some of you are looking at me like, why in the world am I doing that? All right. You, everyone got it? 9.38. Okay. Can you go to the next slide? This is Matthew 9, 37 through 38. Let's read this together, okay? You ready, church? One, two, three, go. 
Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of our harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. All right. That's Matthew 9, 37, 38. So Jesus is saying to us that there is a bountiful harvest out there. And, and the only thing keeping it from really being brought in is the number of laborers who are going out into the harvest and, and, and bringing them in. And so he calls us, in fact, he commands us to pray not just lightly, earnestly. Pray with, pray with power and vigor and might. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in the harvest. So, 938. I call it the 930. I learned this from my friend George Acevedo down at the Grace United Methodist Church in Florida. And he taught his church to pray this, and they've been praying it for years. And, and I want to encourage you, church, to be praying this. So they set their alarm for 938. So every day at 938, whether it be a.m. or p.m., you'll get a ding to remind you to pray. Pray this prayer. Pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest would raise up laborers within our community, within our church, to go out and bring in the, in the harvest. Pray that you might be such a laborer. Pray that God would raise up people in our church who would be passionate about seeking the last, the least, the lost, and the lonely in our community, in, in, in our county, in our state, in our country, in our world. And watch what God does. Did Jesus, promise, did Jesus call us to do this? Yes. Do you think he would fulfill that? Do you think that's a prayer he'll answer? Yes. Yes. So... What an awesome thing it will be at 9.38 if, if, if uh, all of our alarms start going off and each day we remember, hey, I'm going to pray and I'm going to trust that God is going to do this. That God is going to raise up laborers to go out into the harvest and bring it in. And, and, and let us see what a year from now looks like. Let us see what it looks like as God begins to answer that prayer. So I want to invite you to do that. Number five. Lastly, is to serve. Our call is to service. Matthew 20, 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. <coughs> Brother Jeremy Revis shared the word with us last week on this and uh, did a wonderful job. And the, the service that we're called to do is, is serving one another, serving each other, serving within the church. Where are you serving? Where are you serving? Statistics tell me as a pastor, and I, 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 I don't even need to look at statistics because I see it every day, it's just true, that there's this 80-20 this rule within most organizations and most churches, and that is 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And that's, that's just true. But if you're a member of this church, I want to just remind you of the vows you took when you became a member, that you would support your local church for your prayers, your presence, your service. Remember that? That little part right there was nothing. We didn't sneak it in on you. We just said it out in front of everybody. And, and we said, yes, yes, I will support my local church with these things. But service is really about... I mean, I can tell you story after story of, of how much it's a blessing to me to be able to serve others. When I get out of my own head and get out of my own self and serve others, and we have, we have folks here who go above and beyond the call of duty and serve in ways that are just spectacular. We have, we have folks here that aren't even members of this church who are serving in ways that are just blow my mind. And then I know that we have folks here who have been members of this church for a long time and, and just haven't yet found a place to go or serve. We have opportunities for you, and, and we need you. The body of Christ, we need each and every one of us in order to be operating and functioning as we ought to, to be able to fulfill God's mission and purpose for us. So I, I want to ask you, how, who can you serve? How can you serve? How might you be able to just take one step? Maybe it's a small step. 
Maybe, maybe you come and say, hey, you know what, I, I'd like to greet people on Sunday morning as they come get out of their car. I'd like to serve in some way at, at recovery at Dayton on Thursday nights. Maybe just serve a meal. I'd like to serve um, by uh, uh, helping out our Sunday school teachers and just supporting them. I'd like to, uh, there's, there's countless ways in which you can get involved and serve. Come and have those conversations with me or with the leadership team here. We would love to help find you ways in which you can serve and be a part of that. Um, next week, talking about service, I will be uh, beginning a, a short series I think, called When Life Hurts. And um, if, if you're struggling with something, or if you know someone who's struggling with something, I hope you'll go and find them and bring them to Mountain View next week. We're going to be talking about some real stuff. When life, what happens when life hurts? And, and how we can find and seek God in the midst of some of our deepest struggles and pain and hurt. And I just want to share with you briefly, as many of you know, as you've been praying for me and you've been praying for my family, you've been praying for my wife who's hurting right now. And she's going through a, a period of depression and anxiety. And, and that's something that I've, as I've learned and, and been studying and looking more and more into this, I, I've, I've recognized the church's failure in its, its attempt to address those sorts of needs and, and, and to be able to say something to a, a hurting person community and world and a church where people are facing these kinds of things every single day and they don't know where to turn and it can be very hopeless and feel very hopeless. And, and she's been in that spot for about two or three months now. And some days are really good, like Friday was a good day. Today has not been a good day. So if I feel a little out, seem a little out of it, to you today, that, that's kind of why I, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting for my life. Who's hurting me today? And, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. I know a God who can transcend our darkest, hurting, deepest pains and can point us to something great. It doesn't mean that life is a bed of roses or that it all gets better and that we don't experience pain and hurt and brokenness right now. But I know where to turn when I see that or when I feel it myself. I'm learning at least. So next week I'm going to talk to you about some of the things I'm learning as I serve my wife who's hurting. Because some of you may be a, a caretaker or a caregiver to someone who's experiencing this very thing. And, and, and you wonder, I know you do because you come to me and you say, I don't know how to handle this. And that's where I'm at present. And so next week we're going to begin a series on what, when life hurts. What do we do? What, where do we turn? And what can God have to say in the midst of all of this to us? So I hope you'll come back next week. I hope you'll come and, and be a part and bring, bring your friends, bring your family, bring anyone you know who's ever experienced pain. Because guys, if, if we can't talk about pain in the presence of our king who came and took upon himself the form of a servant, and came to live and to die in our midst, and who knew our pain and knew our suffering very intimately, and died in order to transform and give us life, then where do we talk about it? And where do we find healing? And I hope you'll be here next week. And I hope you'll pray for me and pray for my wife as you continue to. I know you are. And I want to just thank you again from the bottom of my heart and from hers for the many gifts and, and, and the, the food Goodness gracious, again, the food. <laughs> I've got more food than I know what to do with. Thank you. Um, but most of all for the prayers and the support. It means the world to us. And uh, um, I thank you.
Thank you for that. With that said, let us turn now to the, the one who came to us and gave himself to us as we serve together. Would you guys mind coming forward and taking your spots? We, we serve a, a, a God who, who knows our most, our darkest places. There's nothing that is hidden from him, and, and he sees it all, and yet he loves us through it all. And he comes to us in the form of this meal that we're about to serve. And we call this the Lord's Supper. We call it Holy Communion. We call this the time where we can come and meet with Jesus here, and he comes to meet with us here in, our, in the midst of whatever it is that's going on in our life and, and wants to nourish us and transform us. And we talk about the five purposes. And, you know, Jesus worshiped God through this meal here by saying, not your will, but my, but not what I will, but your will be done. And it was very hard for him to do, but he did it. He went to the cross for you and I. Jesus fellowship with his disciples, not only all through his ministry, but particularly on that one last night with the Last Supper where he gathered around and he said, Whenever you gather together and meet together, come and share in this meal and remember what I've done for you. Remember the sacrifice that I've made for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And Jesus grew up as well. Jesus grew up, the scripture tells us, through the suffering that he endured. He grew up and learned obedience that he matured through the trials and temptations and the trespasses that he with stood, just like you and I face them today. The Bible says that he was able to endure the cross because he looked to the joy that was set before him. And so we come to this table as a way to remember that this is not all there is, that the problems and the pain and the things that we face in this life are going to be redeemed and restored and renewed. He promised that one day we would one come together and eat this meal together in heaven with him. And Jesus knew his mission and he completed it. He came for the purpose of setting captives free, giving sight to the blind, healing the sick, and, and breaking the chains on the oppressed. To pay the penalty of sin and death that was rightfully mine and yours. And he, he completed that mission. Because he was successful in that mission, we can be assured of peace with God. Jesus served to the very end. His life was one of service to his father and to his fellow man. And he humbled himself and became a servant even unto death, so that we might know life. So here at this table are all the purposes of God brought together. Worship. Fellowship, maturing, growing, mission, service, they're right here. And he welcomes you to this table today to take part in his life, his death, and his resurrection. To remind you of your purpose on earth. To remind you of why he loves you so much and why he gave his life for you. To give you strength for the journey, something tangible to hold on to so that we won't forget who he is and who we are. You don't have to be a United Methodist or a member of this church to come and take part in this, this supper. You just have to have a desire, a hunger and a thirst to want to know Jesus, to want to be in his life, to be a part of his life. If, you, if that desire is inside of you today, I want to invite you to come and take part of this. Leonard, would you come and join me and help me serve today? share in one loaf as a reminder that we are of one body. And we come together as one. And Christ broken for us so that we might know life.
the cup of salvation, the blood of Christ that was poured out for you and for me and for the sins of all the world was shed so that you and I might be reconciled to God. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Thank you. 